All right, well, welcome everyone to Reset Air Quality Monitoring for the Built Environment. This course is approved for uh, GBCI, AIBD, Certified Green Professional, BPI, Non-Whole House, as well as AIA Health, Welfare, and Safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. Uh, this session is brought to you by the Green Home Institute, um, and my name's Brett Little, and I will be the moderator and host of this session today. Um, how do we take our air quality to the next level by being able to be informed and monitoring it uh, and being able to verify what's actually going on in our homes and our buildings? That's really what we're going to be talking about. And before we get to that, a huge thanks to our top tier sponsor, Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi provides all your heating, cooling, and filtration needs in one system. Today's low load homes require right sized equipment that most systems, especially gas fired, cannot meet. Mitsubishi has low load, high efficient heat pumps that dehumidify and cool in the summer and work in reverse to heat in the winter. Going ductless can also reduce costs and make it easier to achieve Energy Star or LEED certification. Ductless mini splits can be now be hidden behind the walls uh, to serve different purposes. Uh, ducted systems are also hidden to ensure a beautiful space and they can be retrofitted right in uh, like an existing furnace on single family or multifamily. Uh, set your system to dry mode when cooling is not needed to help remove any kind of excess humidity. And then hyperheat ensures efficient heat delivery down to negative 13 degrees and backup strip heaters kick in during those really rare but cold days. Each room can be customized for comfort. Uh, same for multifamily commercial centralized variable refrigerant flow systems. Work great on large projects. And heat recovery can be added to simultaneously heat and cool different spaces of the building all at one time. Check them out over at MitsubishiComfort.com. And thanks to our second tier sponsor, Build Equinox, with the CRV Smart Ventilation System. These systems help monitor air quality uh, and then ventilate as needed rather than overventilating. With a standard ERV or HRV, you get constant airflow with no relation to actual indoor air quality or occupancy. Um, but the serve actually ventilates uh, as needed and it monitors that air quality. Um, it can go up to 300 CFM, which gets into much larger uh, buildings as needed for ventilation and can recirculate the air um, uh, and help unify the home when, uh, when it's not needed. It does this by monitoring CO2 and volatile organic compounds and then makes determinations based on presets um, from the people who uh, installed the system to determine what levels they want their thresholds to be set at. And instead of an ERV, the exchange core uses a high efficiency heat pump, which maintains uh, extreme comfort both uh, in the heating and cooling season. Serve is manufactured right in Urbana, Illinois, uh, in a facility that's powered 100% by solar. Works very well with ream heat pumps to boost capacity and radiant. Uh, works really well with Mitsubishi ductless systems to distribute air. And works really well with their GeoBoost systems and water furnace for uh, air source, uh, ground source heat pump systems. Check them out over at uh, buildequinox.com. All right, well, I'm really excited to introduce you to our um, uh, speaker today, uh, Anjanette Green. Anjanette is a co-author and director of standards and developments for Reset, the world's first standard and certification program utilizing continuous monitoring data to ensure the health performance of the built environment. Anjana consulted on the first certified reset air projects in the world and has been on the forefront of research and critical analysis of health and well-being of building occupants for a better part of her career. So with that, uh, welcome, and I will pass it off to you. Uh, Anjanette, please take it away. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, um, again, for the opportunity. Thanks, Brett, for inviting me. Um, I have to admit, before you uh, invited me to this event, I wasn't overly familiar with your group. So I'm really interested in talking to such a focused and learned sort of professional team, but with a very specific focus on building better environments for the home and uh, residential sector and hopefully well beyond. Because I think what we're talking about today is applicable to a lot of environments. Um, and so if at any point you have questions that are specific to a project typology that you are interested in, Brett has agreed to sort of field some of these questions as they come in and we'll have uh, hopefully a nice chunk of time for Q&A at the end. So please don't hesitate to type in your questions and post them so that we can address them um, as expeditiously as possible. 
And again, um, just a quick introduction. For those who have not heard of Reset before, I'm going to give you a sort of 10,000 foot view of the standard, uh, a little bit of its history, and hopefully if we have some time, I'm going to dig into some details of how the standard harmonizes and potentially looks at um, some sort of case studies or how these pollutants can be applicable to today's pandemic conditions, which of course is I think foremost on everyone's mind. So the standard really briefly in a nutshell is a standard that is based on data quality. That is the entire position of the standard. And so understanding the importance of having standards around data quality I think is a hard nut to crack sometimes. It's a fairly new field and a new sort of way of thinking about um, green building schemes. But without data, it's very hard for us to monitor buildings and understand how we can improve them. And without standards around the data, we have no idea of its validity or quality. So the RESET standard is wholly based on data quality standards and how that is applied to real estate. And again, if you have questions, please reach out to anybody at the Reset team. My email is here, agreen at reset.build, and reset.build is also the website. So as mentioned, I'm the director of the standards. I co-authored um, the Reset Air module, as you see it, and we are in works for several other standards and modules to come. I'll talk about that in a second. I am currently based in Mexico, but I live in Spain. But during the pandemic, um, it's been difficult to get to Europe, as those probably on the phone understand. Um, so at any point, I have had my sort of place in various parts of the world and have prided myself on being very sensitive to understanding how do you apply building standards on a holistic level, not just in the US, um, not just in North America, but how do we understand air quality and standardization of this in the middle of Mumbai or in Beijing or in Shanghai or in New Zealand. And I think that's really important for all of us these days to have an international perspective on how we're gonna bring the green building environment up to par. So we're an international performance standard and a certification program. And I think it's important to say that we are a standard that can be folded into numerous green building programs um, for dual cert uh, certification, or you can use the standard on its own irrespective of certification. You need not try for certification on all projects all the time. We understand that. For some people, the standard and what it involves is far more important than a certification. And so I think that if I could come up with a different way of describing what certification means for reset, I, I would use it um, because it's ongoing performance. It's not just a one-time accolade and then you walk away, it's forever. So you are continually certifying. So the standard is something that has been easily um, pointed to in other green building schemes. And using that data for further analysis is what I think makes the RESET standard so strong. Now, how do you create a standard for data? There's three really critical parts, and the theme of these three parts will be repeated because without these three pieces, you, you cannot have validity and uh, credibility in data as it's being reported. The first part of a standard for this type of application is you need to have credible devices that are bringing the data in. So in other words, you need to have monitors, you need to have devices, you need to have that technology verified. So this part addresses the quality at the source, at the building. Do you have monitors that are reliable? Are they accredited or are they unknowns? And this can be applied to monitoring energy, monitoring water, monitoring air, as we're going to be talking about today. And in a, in, a, in a very dynamic way, monitoring of materials. So it's attesting to the validity of the source. The next part of that is the data reporting. In other words, OK, great, I have a, a wonderful device on the wall that's measuring my air. How does that data come in? Where does it go? So you need to have standards that package that data and can aggregate it and ensure that the data that is being reported by one body is comparable to another. So this is a way to draw a line in the sand that says my data can be compared apples to apples to your building data. 
Now, this is important in your own home. If you're trying to look at room by room data, you want to have consistency. But it's also really important when you're comparing maybe your building to another building it's owned by another individual or buildings across your entire portfolio around the world. If you don't have comparability, the data is fairly useless. The last piece is how do you analyze that data? And this is really the toolkit. This is like the toolbox where you can actually dive into the data and cut through it for deeper analytics and understand how do you communicate those results to your tenants or to your school teachers, um, to any of the users and stakeholders. The communication of the data results is just as important as the data itself. So that is an analytics, it's the reset cloud, if you will. So I know that was a lot, um, but just to kind of give you a little backup history here, there's a, a timeline that's just a, a quick snapshot of our history. Well prior to 2017, we uh, were working on the standard, but 2017 is when we initially piloted 43 projects and that equated to 87,000 square meters of total project space. It was very small. Um, but fast forward to 2020, we're almost at 1.1 million square meters of project space. And one of the things that we're really proud of is that our accredited professionals have followed that trajectory. So you can see in just a short order, we've actually attained far more square meters of project space than we ever anticipated. And just in 2019 alone, by looking at our heat map of our accredited professionals globally, um, you can not only see the hotspots showing where professionals are really taking off, obviously in places where air quality is critical, India, Asia, um, but we've seen a 387% increase in our APs. Um, and even moving to a virtual learning platform, we train every single one of our APs by only three professional trainers. So everybody who is trained as an AP gets one-on-one -on -one attention and they go into the technical details of how to actually deploy a successful air quality deployment plan. Um, you have to have an reset AP on your project because of the technicalities of, of the standard. So as I mentioned, there's several modules of how you can use data um, and apply it to the built environment. The modules here are a couple that I think most people are familiar with our Reset Air module, that's our, our famous one. We recently released the Reset Materials standard. It is in pilot stage and being peer reviewed for the second time now over the course of four years. And we are introducing modules for energy, water and circularity. Mm, the thing to, to take away from this is that you need not do all of these modules. The idea is that these are always going to be intentionally separate. You don't have to, if energy is not something you are interested in monitoring, you need not pursue it. But if you will only want to monitor air, that is fine. They're meant to be incremental. You can uh, um, pursue them in whatever manner is best for your environment. So I'm going to talk about air today because that is, of course, the the, the hot topic. And I think that this is a, um, hopefully something that's um, near and dear to everybody's heart right now, is that understanding your air quality brings you that much closer to understanding the health of your interior and exterior spaces. And so with the air module, there's five main parameters that we're looking for, or pollutants, if you will. PM 2.5. TVOC, which is a collection of off-gassing, so total volatile organic compounds, CO2, temperature, and humidity. So you'll remember I mentioned this idea of having three different parts to a successful deployment program. When you're looking under the context of air, this is what that looks like. We call it the data quality ecosystem. So obviously, as mentioned, you need to have quality monitors. Reset has a standard for the monitors. Um, we don't sell monitors, but we do have a standard by which the monitors are tested. And if they pass that, they become accredited. It's required that you have an accredited monitor on a reset project in order to certify. Um, the second is having, as I mentioned, a reset AP. You need to have somebody who knows where to deploy these monitors and how many. And every project is different. Air is complex and so is the deployment. So you need to have somebody who understands this process and can install successfully. And the last piece is what I said before, that toolkit, that data analytics is where you can actually aggregate that data, but that is done by a third party. 
So you have an unbiased collector and aggregator of the data that's coming in from your monitors who does not have a conflict of interest with the monitor itself. And this is really important because you also need to be accredited to become a data platform. And this means that these data platforms do not own the data, but rather the client does. And the data can be looked at at any point, at any time. And these platforms are audited. So this allows a two-way street for the information to come in so that your data doesn't come into some sort of black box somewhere and dies. It basically allows for that data to be flowed in any direction that you wish. So again, if certification is not of interest, but the data is, you own that data and you can take it and fold it into all kinds of different metrics. You could use it towards your well certification. You could use it towards um, best practices for your, for your building. You can use that data in any way that you wish. So again, this is that really important platform uh, that's a tool in your toolkit. So how does Reset really sort of work? At a glance, and I'm gonna be very you know, vague here with some of the criteria, but just for the purposes of understanding, I like to use the analogy of, of sort of federal system and a state system. Your federal system is reset for core and shell, and your state system is reset interiors. And that could be a commercial interior, a residential interior, um, whatever typology you're looking at. But separate those two because not only is the deployment very different, but the criteria of the pollutants is different. So Core and Shell is really looking at the air quality as monitored outside your building before it comes into your HVAC system. So that's your outdoor air intake. What is the air prior to it coming into your system? And then it's looking at after the air has passed through your system as it's designed with filters and heating and cooling coils, all those things that are in there, at the supply side, it's checking it again so that you have a comparison between before and after. And so what Reset is doing is it's allowing your HVAC system and your owners and operators, the people who are in charge of that, understand very clearly what the air quality is when it's at the supply before it goes into interior spaces and becomes mixed. The interior side is looking at sort of the opposite um, because human behaviors have so much impact on indoor air quality. So it's a very different deployment and it's looking at very different things. And it's largely looking at things like cooking or smoking inside or burning incense or vacuuming uh, on dusty carpets, all the things that happen in interior space, the state system, all these little states that are running independently of that federal system, they can then be analyzed in their own right. And when you decouple these two pieces of the puzzle, it makes it so much easier when you have the uh, issue of air quality to go to the source to figure out where the problems are coming from. And I think that, again, one of the strengths of our program is that if you're a tenant and you're renting in a space, you have the ability to look at your air quality and understand if you are doing things that impact your air and you can remediate, or if you need to go to the source and talk to your building owner, because it seems that there might be a problem that's coming from the filtration system. And the opposite is true for the building and maintenance team. They no longer are constantly having the finger pointing at them for problems that could be uh, based from behaviors. Now with that, it's really important to understand that you've got interior, exterior, and induct applications, and all monitors are made for specific purposes. So fit for purpose is really important to address. So on the far left, you've got indoor monitors. These are ones probably some of you have seen. You put them on the wall, you can plug them in, or you can use a Wi-Fi system. Some of them have indicators face forward, some don't. You have an induct model, which is a highly specialized piece of equipment for the mom in a case and it has some kind of extraction tube or um, pipe that goes into a duct where it extracts air at very measured pieces so that you can get air quality at the supply side. And then outdoor monitors, which maybe some of you have seen on consulates or air sampling stations across the US. And these are highly um, specialized pieces of equipment that can withstand heat, temperature, snow, insects, wind, that kind of thing. So again, price points for these are gonna vary as well. So it's important to understand before you go into a deployment, talking to an AP who can also give you some pricing um, exercises to go through depending on your particular deployment case. So I always get asked, what are the targets? What are the thresholds for each of these pollutants? 
So on the top, I know this is a really heavy slide, lots of text, but basically running across the top, you'll see that band of blue and white looks across the different pollutants. And it's telling you what the acceptable levels are for each of those. And on the bottom are this, this requirements for core and shell. Um, one thing that is important to take away from this is that temperature and humidity, you'll notice, are only required to be monitored. And this is, of course, every region is different. That does not create standards for what temperature and humidity you should be hold, held to because of different zoning issues and code issues and adhering to comfort modules. Um, things like ASHRAE and ISO standards will establish temperature and humidity recommendations. So we hold the teams to actually follow those, but monitoring those is critical because temperature and humidity have such an influence on things like TVOC um, and even PM 2.5. So you really need to have those. It's requisite that you understand your temperature and humidity. Things like PM 2.5, TVOC, and CO2, we do not create those targets ourselves, but we rather point to things such as World Health Organization and uh, US EPA for those standards. So those targets will continue to change with rigor as those authoritative bodies change the requirements. Now, I mentioned before that communicating the data is just as important as the data itself. And one of the things that people get really worried about, um, maybe not so much a homeowner, but rather somebody who is an owner of a building and they have tenants, they're very concerned about a monitor that posts information outward facing. And if the numbers look bad, they're very nervous about litigation or the probability of people freaking out because they think their air is toxic. And I, I think it's really important to understand that <clears throat> a number on a monitor is very often an index. And that index is representative of some kind of algorithm or a calculation that happens on the back end. So facing forward, a lot of monitors will have some kind of number or it will be green if it's good air and red if it's bad. The reset standard is looking at data coming in from these monitors in a very different way. And so there's a huge education piece that needs to take place that ensures people that what you're seeing, if you have a monitor that's face forward with some kind of data, they either need to understand it in the proper context for that device, or I always recommend covering it because it's not required that you have that facing forward for a reset project. Um, the data that comes in for the purposes of reset are based on very different parameters. It's looking at the hours of occupancy. Um, for example, if your office is nine to six, you're not gonna be monitoring it and posting the numbers on a 24 hour basis. It's looking at monthly data cycles, because again, we're trying to establish historical performance ongoing for the life of the building, 20, 40, 50 years. If you have an anomaly of an air event that happens for one minute, that might not be cause for concern. Now, if it happens for an hour every day at the same time, and you have historical evidence to look at, then that could indicate a problem. So there's a very big difference between how the data appears and how the data is actually being aggregated. We're also looking at the data on a parameter by parameter basis, each pollutant at a time. A lot of indexes um, are a collection of all of those and then they post a number that's reflective and it might be very high because it's a combination of all of the parameters and then we're looking at daily average packages of time so it's 30 minute intervals where the data points are taken every five minutes so this is over the totality of the project so i think it's really important again for people to understand that data that's coming in from a building is complex and you can't simply look at a one-time uh, uh, number without understanding it. So just because you have a number that's high is not indicative of a project's overall performance. So how does the reset standard work with other green building schemes? Um, because I am heavily invested in all of these different certifications, um, either as an accredited professional with them or as an auditor or ambassador, any, any number of these projects I have worked as, as an advisor on writing the credits for, or I have helped to work on these projects throughout the globe. And I understand the complexity and the frustration that arises when one standard says one thing and another one tells you another, and trying for dual certification means you have to do twice as much work. 
So I have made it my life's work to ensure that we have harmonizations that work nicely with all of these and do not compete. So as I said before, RESET is a standard first and a certification second. All of these different programs have pointed to the RESET standard in their air quality requirements in some manner or another, either as an equivalent or as a pathway to certification. So I'm just gonna point out a couple here. Um, there are more, but I think for this partic particular audience, I'm gonna point out a couple. Um, First of all, with LEED, we unfortunately don't have a crosswalk that works nicely with LEED residential. And that is not because they don't want it to. Um, talking to their team over the last couple of years, it's because the way that they have written the standard for the device. The device right now that they have written is only for a handheld device, which is different than continuous monitoring. So what they would like to do in the future and the uh, draft credit that they're working on now is going to change that. But the requirements for the pollutants are the same. You'll see TVOC and CO2, a lot of that repetitive because of course, these are the things that we want to monitor for an indoor environment. So for LEED O&M, you can use RESET for your initial certification or for recertification. And that is to satisfy what is written in the standard for TVOC and CO2. Now, one thing that I think it's really worth noting is that at this time, measurements for PM 2.5 are not currently counted towards credits. And the team at LEED is working furiously to correct that because the importance of PM 2.5 on human health is far too important to leave aside. So look for changes, hopefully, to that. Right now, you would get exemplary points if you were to pursue and monitor PM 2.5 but TVOC and CO2, as you would submit to ARC for recertification, um, is the way to go, and RESET would be applicable to that. This is also applicable, heavily referenced, in the ARC re-entry. So I don't know how many people are familiar with ARC re-entry, but this is a distinct certification from LEED, and re-entry was introduced in, in the heart of the pandemic for the purposes of trying to get people back into the office. And I didn't have time to put all of the references of RESET in it, but if you go to the link that's posted at the bottom, you'll see that RESET will help as a pathway for monitoring and throughout the document, RESET is referenced with links so that you can go immediately to the sources that you need for posting into ARC. WELL has been uh, outstanding in their harmonization with us for both versions um, prior to V2 and the current V2 version. Very straightforward. All you need to do is um, present your reset air certification and your site audit checklist, and that will satisfy all of these um, various points under the core and shell well certification, as well as the non-core certification. So basically the takeaway from this is that it will satisfy the feature A01, A01 part five, 1.3, so on and so forth for initial certification or for recertification. So it's assigned as an equivalent. So again, a dual certification slam dunk with this one because if you have your reset certification, all you need to do is prove by submission to the <coughs> well assessor and receive your credits accordingly. Fitwell also is extremely straightforward in both their old version and the current one. You can apply this to any of these six building types. Fitwell has expanded, so all six project types under 6.4, indoor air quality testing, you can use any of the strategies that are listed, one, two, three, or reset. So again, all you need to do is prove by proof of award your reset certification to receive 6.4 credits. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And one of the things that I really wanna talk about is that you cannot currently, under any technology that we know of, no matter what people will tell you, you cannot continuously monitor and detect an airborne pathogen the size of a SARS-CoV-2 virus. There is no technology that can do that. <clears throat> There's different technologies that can actually take samples, put it into some kind of Petri dish and send it for lab diagnostics. That's doable. But the, I think the more important thing here is not to try to detect a naked virus as it's floating around in the air, but rather detect the air that makes virus transmission probable. And that is easily done because we've been doing that already. Um, temperature, humidity, PM, occupant densities is indicative of CO2. These are 
proxies by which we can understand air quality and with that start to understand the applicability of having SARS-CoV-2 virus in our spaces. Doesn't mean that it is there, it just means that you may or may not have conditions that are ripe for some kind of viral transmission. And that's a really important distinction to make. I think that people are getting extremely nervous about their inability to detect a virus in the space when really that is not the end game. I think understanding our air quality in a more holistic way is far more important because whether it be this pandemic or the next one, if we have data that tells us what our conditions are, are they ripe for infection or are they helping to um, allay infection, that is a far better position for us to be in. So what we did at Reset is we looked at the scientific data on viruses in human health, human immune system health, that could be monitored using continuous monitoring technology. By looking at the scientific research to date on virus survivability, in other words, what conditions does it like? The SARS-CoV-2 virus in one and influenza tend to like temperatures that are cool and air that is dry. So temperature and humidity, as we know, can be reliably monitored through continuous monitoring sensors. So looking at that and the impact of temperature and humidity on the viral health was part one. Part two was data talking about impacts on the human immune system. Temperature, humidity, and PM2.5. Again, these are monitoring parameters that are easily done, can be done, and can impact human health once we know what they are. The last piece of that is dosage, what we're calling dosage over time, which is basically a proxy of CO2. It tells you how many people are in a room, how much air is not being circulated or exchanged or exhausted or cleaned, would be indicative of probability of CO2 and air that would be laden with viral uh, infection. So all of that together will allow us to see with a, a, a number, an index, if you will. So remember I talked about a, a number being representative and understanding what is behind that number. This end product is the reset index that talks about the optimal levels of um, performance for a building and also the probability of infection. Now, again, we know that there are far more impacts um, that would actually affect the virus in a space, but we're looking at it in terms of what can we monitor. The important thing is, again, you know, we've known for a really long time that exposure to PM 2.5 is really harmful for people, and it's no shock to me that Harvard TJH Chan study came out and said that with a one microgram um, cubic exposure to um, PM 2.5 will increase your mortality if you're so unfortunate to become ill with COVID-19, mortality is increased by 8%. And so why for an airborne pathogen are we not doing more to actually measure quantities of PM 2.5 in our spaces? And then further, why is the advice right now to open all the doors and windows without knowing what the air is that's coming into your space? And so, Again, we're asking people to look at data instead of following advice too blindly. Um, when you actually bring in 100% outdoor air, depending on if that air is dry, if it's dirty, and if it's cold, you are going to increase the potential for virus survivability. At the same time, as mentioned, the human immune system does not work, to work at its optimal level in cold and dry temperatures, as the a wide body of research indicates. And while the exposure risk, that dosage might go down, one, because we do not have people in full capacity as we typically have in, build, in building spaces, offices, for example. Um, and also if you're bringing in outside air, the idea is that you're mixing and diluting it. While that dosage might go down, the whole string of events does not optimize your building. In fact, you're 17% optimized and you've got an infection potential that is at 30%. And again, this is based on the data as we know it, but still I think it gives a, a more robust picture that we need to be cautious of before we start opening doors and windows with uh, reckless abandon, especially in areas where we had things like wildfires preventing us from opening doors and windows. So what that index is showing, again, is that the first number is an optimization. It's looking at the building. Is this optimal for the building? 
And the next two are showing, is this aerosol infection potential rate high or low? And the last piece is certainty. And that certainty piece is really critical because it's showing how much confidence we have in the data to date. So with a certain degree of confidence, um, and hopefully that number will continue to change as we get more and more data in on this particular virus and how it acts in temperature, humidity, and PM 2.5. Now, I think the important part of this is for project teams who want to use the reset index and want to cut through the data and use it, it's important to know that the data that comes in from your monitors goes into the reset cloud, it gets looked at under its analytical lens, but you can pull that data back out again. So if you have a building automated system, if you have a BMS system, you have some kind of system where you want to actually control your buildings and you wanna have signals that come from the reset index or from the cloud, you can arrange to have that done. So a two-way open API is critical to actually applying the data into real life um, situations, making our buildings work smarter, not harder. And with that, it's a lot of information, but with that, I hope I have left um, sufficient time for some Q&A. But again, our website reset.build has a host of information on it. We also have a lot of um, recorded webinars, everything from uh, modules that talk about the history and inception of the program, um, modules that talk about each pollutant one at a time, the importance of PM 2.5, what is TVOC, um, and a couple of uh, deeper dives into the index as well. All of these being pre-recorded, you can watch them for free at any time. And the standards are also available on the website. We do not charge for the standards. You can download those at any point. There's the reset standard for core and shell, the reset standard for interiors, and then a subset of interiors reset for residential, as well as all of the standards for the monitor standard, the criteria and testing standards, as well as data provider standards. So there's a lot of resources, but at this point, I would open up to any live questions that you might have. Hey, thank you so much again, uh, Anjanette. And yeah, as those uh, questions are coming in, just real quick before we get to those, uh, if you need your continuing ed, please look for it to pop up at the end here. Take the survey. Uh, it'll get sent to you an hour later. If you miss it, don't worry. And even if you don't need continuing ed, please take the survey. Let us know how we did so we can do better. And then real quick, for those of you watching this in the future, go to our YouTube link or various link of what platform you're watching it on. Click show more, and then on the right, click need see use, and you can grab the link and get your 80% passing rate to get your continuing ed. And as always, a huge thanks to our board of directors, our volunteers, and all of our top tier sponsors, Mitsubishi, Electrix, Build Equinox, CERV, Smart Ventilation, Ream for heat pump, water heater, super energy efficient. Thanks to um, all of them. So uh, yeah, there are um, some, uh, questions here uh, and you know one thing I'm just kind of trying to understand especially when it comes to uh, multifamily is um, I'm the way I'm kind of thinking about it is core and shell is sort of that hallway that common space um, you know a community room and then the um, the the other the interiors is inside of your unit is that how it works with the program do I have that right I mean, that's a valid question, and it really depends on the mechanical system, how it's set up. So the core and shell, uh, depending if you've got an outdoor air intake, let's say you've got packaged RTUs or something up on the roof, and that's where your main air intake is, um, that's where you would be placing your monitors at the, at the, you know, mm. at the source. Now, mm. how that HVAC system connects down through the rest of the building is anybody's guess. Because again, the point is you're trying to get a before and after. And if the after, if that supply does go down through different mechanical floors, for example, that then split and deliver air supply, whether it be to community rooms or to, um, you know, it's probably not going to an elevator shop, but if it's going to those different supply areas, the point is following that line and understanding, okay, as long as my monitor is post filtration, that's, that's the reading that I want. And I think what you raise is a really important question is that, you know, for those teams that are interested in pursuing core and shell, you, you have to have your mechanical engineer on staff and they do need to have some kind of understanding of the mechanical system. You, you would not want to undertake that yourself. You would need to have somebody who understands the mechanical drawings and whether that's an existing old building, which we've seen, 
or a brand new building that is in just design schematic, those things need to be laid out beforehand. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're not you're not far off. I think that just the important thing is to understand is post filtration and and pre filtration is core and shell. Post and pre, okay. Um, and then thinking, taking it even further to our friends who are doing single family residential, what where would they fit in in this picture? So single family and multifamily, I think are so. These are so great, and I'm so excited because we have our very first um, multifamily. Uh, I'm calling them multi-dwelling is a better word because single-family residential or a freestanding brick and mortar or um, a, a semi-detached or a whole detached. That is a very straightforward application for residential. Reset re residential is an easy fit. And the thing to think about with that that makes residential so different from an office is that your occupants are 24-7. You know, especially now, you know, our homes have become our offices, our homes yeah. are eating there, we're sleeping there. So mm. monitoring is done on a 24 mm. seven basis. That would be very different than a nine to five office, let's say. Um, the other part is that sleep is such an important part of human health that it is required that the areas that are used for sleeping have monitors in them. That is a requirement. So if you're trying to do a quick assessment, like how many monitors would I need for a multifamily or for a single, think of how many bedrooms, and that would be your monitor calc. The multifamily are interesting because we are able to take a percent or take a floor, for example. And if you only wanted to pursue, let's say, for a green premium in a multifamily, um, and you're trying to sell the whole building, maybe you just certify one floor under the interiors program. Um, and then that way you, you're not doing the entire building. If you wanted to do it in chunks, you could. You could also, therefore, for all the subsequent floors, you could actually just have them monitor ready. So as tenants move in, if they decide to upgrade to a reset certified space, they have the ability to do that. That gives a lot of flexibility for the building owner to decide if that's something they want to offer as an incentive for having people move in. They ha can pay for that as, as part of their utilities or they can opt out if they so choose. When monitor ready, do you mean like it's it's sort of pre-wired, there's space to put it? Well, how does that work? Precisely, that basically you have capacity, you've pulled cables so that you could actually wire those in if you would like to and that would be for both data and electrical. Interesting. And that's a pretty easy, fix um that's that's just basically any kind of thermostat monitoring system the the mm. only caveat is that it has to have data mm. ready so your cat5 cable or whatever cabling you're using for your building you'd need to pull those and make sure that they're ready for acceptance of a monitor okay um the next question is on training um what uh you know how do folks who are interested in pursuing a reset ap how does that training work? Is it live? Is it on demand? A little bit of both. When do when do they occur? So the AP sessions for exams, um, we do those on a crowd based system. Mm -hmm. So crowdsourcing. So it's by demand. And because again, we're an international standard, we have we have trainings that happen all over the world in various languages. So right. it depends on where you're located. Once we have enough uh, requests for a certain time zone or area, we will actually then pronounce that um, and we'll invite as many as 20 seats hmm. for each training. We keep them very, hmm. very small because they're five hour sessions and they're incredibly intense. And as I said, they're one-on-one -on -one trainings. Um, we advertise when we have those on the Reset website. The other way of doing this is if you wanted to organize a private group, let's say your organization would like to have it for your team and your team alone, that's totally allowed. Or hmm. you can have that just for yourselves and invite anybody else in the public who, who is interested to join. So there are a variety of ways to do it. Um, the course involves a lot bigger, um, a deeper dive into the technical deployment requirements. The mm -hmm. beauty of it is that at the end, in order to attain your accreditation, you have to have had successfully designed, calculated, and deployed a CS and a CI. So that is your test, that is your exam. So everybody leaving um, the mm -hmm. session has had hands-on experience and has written their own deployment plan. And I think this is a great way to make sure that people are sort of vetting out the questions in process 
And also when it comes time for them to do a deployment plan for a client, it's not the first time they're doing it. By then they will have already done it twice. And mm -hmm. the reset process is really um, interesting because in order mm -hmm. to protect the AP, the requirements for the AP, um, when it comes to a submission of a plan is your design, your deployment plan is submitted and then audited at that point. Once it's approved, that is the plan that the project deploys and sticks to. So your job as an AP at that point is more or less done because the performance is up to the building. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a really interesting way of flipping the, the responsibilities mm -hmm. of a professional a little bit because mm -hmm. on a lot of certifications, we sort of throw a Hail Mary and we don't really know if we're gonna get those credits. We're hoping that we will, but we don't know until mm -hmm. often it's too late. With our standard, you have to have your deployment project. It has to be approved before your project team goes and buys monitors, before they start pulling cable, before they do any of that. You are already passed through that audit period. So it's approved. There's no questions. You're no, there's no second guessing. The rest of it is up to the building. The building has to perform to target. Hmm. Um, so it's really interesting the ap so just to be clear they do a, a plan for you they don't actually have to have a project that completes right just an approved plan from their training right right, right. So um, the role of the ap is to actually create that deployment plan and to make right. sure that the installation of it goes accordingly does the deployment plan need to be for a real project then or that could just be a theoretical one that they're looking at or in their training anyway. oh, to, to do the training, it's a written exam. So the deployment is only an on-paper written exam. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And are the APs, um, you know, it sounds like your agency as well as the monitoring are really the third-party entities. Are the APs also have to be third-party? Are they typically on staff at a site? Are they typically consultants? What kind of APs are you seeing? What's required? That's a great question. So APs wear several hats. The first, of course, is um, they're champions of the program, they're people who understand it, and if there's a project in region and they're unaware of it, if that project comes to us and says, we need an AP because it's a requirement, we will point to people in the region. And the APs that we have on the Reset website are there with all of their information. So your AP portal is managed by you as an individual, you have your contact information on it, and ideally, of course, the AP is in region. Um, we think the best way for a project to be successful mm -hmm. is, of course, to have an AP who understands air quality in the region. Now, it's not required, mm -hmm. but it's certainly re um, recommended. Mm -hmm. And so for APs that are out there um, who we want to sort of do any matchmaking, if we can, we will. Um, but they're not necessarily third parties. Um, it's what we've seen are APs that are in the consultant realm already mm -hmm. and adding uh, reset AP to their quiver. You know, they're a well AP, they're LFA, they're lead AP, and now they're reset AP. So that's an offering mm -hmm. that they can give. Um, so there's really no third party requirements. It just happens mm -hmm. to be that way often. Um, the one third party piece is that an auditor, we have a document auditor, as I mentioned, and we have a site audit. That mm -hmm. cannot be the reset AP for the project. And I think mm -hmm. that's probably in, in parallel with a lot of other auditing processes. So an auditor is also a reset AP who has been mm -hmm. invited to that status. It is a paid position and mm -hmm. an audit is done on a documentation mm -hmm. side and on site. Now, because of the pandemic, we have been doing a lot of the audits um, virtually, which mm -hmm. is completely doable, highly successful, not a problem. We, mm -hmm. of course, would prefer to do on site, especially for core and shell. But you know, in the interim, we've been OK mm -hmm. with doing virtual audits. Mm -hmm. But an auditor mm -hmm. is somebody who's had a sufficient uh, experience on projects to, to warrant that title. Um, that's great. Um, now, so then, sorry, so your auditors who are APs, they're actually employed by the company, or you mean paid as like a subcontractor? They would be paid as a subcontractor. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, help, that helps, I think, uh, helps our audience understand AP, but if there's any other AP questions, um, let us know. Uh, I want to get a little bit into the technology. You know, I, um, I'm i planning a home improvement project here, and we, before I did it, it includes ventilation, and so I wanted to test my air quality 
before I do anything to see, you know, pre and post, right? So I'm using two different uh, higher end, you know, expensive, I would call expensive on the market, you know, devices. I have them right next to each other up in my living room and they're both, I'm gonna see what kind of data, I've been getting data from them for months now and I'm gonna get pre-data. I posted that online. I remember one of my colleagues, who I really appreciate, kind of came in and said, well, you know, these devices aren't reset certified. I believe it was reset or some kind of certification. And so, you know, it can be very concerning on really what kind of data you're getting. Is it real data? And my thought was interesting. Like on one end, it's like, is it more important to have, you know, is it, is it, is it more important to have some kind of data, whether it's certified or not? Uh, or is it more important to just you just have nothing and then just wait until you can get like one of your devices? So I, I guess I'm kind of throwing that question out there and then to ask, you know, what is it for manufacturers to get these products that they're promoting that everyone's putting in their homes now certified? What is the why aren't they getting them certified? <laughs> Tons of great questions. Yeah. The, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the first the first issue is that there there. There is no standard for continuous mm. monitoring except for the reset standard. Nobody mm. had one. Mm -hmm. There were standards for what are called FEM or FRM, so it's federal reference monitors. Those are like mm. 10 to 15,000 mm. heavy duty pieces of equipment. These are mm. the devices that are used up on, you know, consulates and buildings. They give us the EPA air now kind of .gov information, mm. but mm. they're measuring very very differently than continuous mm. monitors. And so to date, aside from the reset standard, there is no standard for continuous monitoring sensors. Now, let's just mm. back up for a second. A sensor, mm. that is a, the chip, for lack of a better word, that has the ability to detect a very specific uh, pollutant, CO2, for example, a gas sensor, um, is, is one part of multiple sensors that are in a monitor. So a monitor is a device such as your iPhone and the technology that's inside it is the sensor. So a lot of people put R&D into like how beautiful this thing is and mm -hmm. how cool it looks. Um, and so that's what you're paying for. The sensors inside are actually purchased from only a handful of specialists in the world. So there mm -hmm. are only a few mm -hmm. in, in the world, the market, um, Japan, I, North, Sweden, and, and the US have a lion's share of those sensors, the quality ones. So the inferior part comes from uh, how those sensors have been put into the motherboard. And we've seen sensors, when we've tested them, fail because they used a high VOC glue to glue the sensors to the board. So, you, you know, I think it's still very much a buyer beware market out there. And I can't attest to how your monitors are um, in respect to the, the test of, of reset because I don't know what you're using. And secondly, it could be that they're really great. Um, mm -hmm. We don't know. So until they have actually put themselves in the position to be tested, um, we don't have anything to measure them by. So the only thing I would say with the reset standard is that we have criteria that separates into categories of A, B, and C, and that's based mm -hmm. on the specific um, detection and its sensitivity. And then there's other requirements such as it has to have the ability to, to pull the data at certain increments and, and that type of thing. But every sensor in a monitor has its own specific criteria that it has to meet. So the criteria for a PM sensor is different than that of a VOC. So where I'm going with this is that um, because at least we have some kind of test that these monitors have to be put to, I would therefore recommend and feel better about a reset accredited monitor. I would also recommend that you look at how the monitor is calibrated. And you can do that by using a device that is further specific and further sensitive than your monitor. And that's mm -hmm. usually by a handheld mm -hmm. device. Hmm. Um, if you don't know what a handheld device is or a direct read um, monitor is, there are great resources. Um, often these can be rented from either a building hygienist or if you know somebody who's perhaps a well assessor. Um, or if you go to uh, like PG&E actually in California, they have a lending library where you can actually lease one of these for a day. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can actually have a calibration, a device by which you can see if your device is accurate or not. 
And that's a little bit more technical, I think, than most people are prepared for, but I just want to make sure that there's a management of expectation here. There are crappy devices out on the market that say they're great, and there's low budget $200 devices that are accredited. And so the only way for you to know the difference is to actually do a little bit of homework. So, I mean, that's kind of the other, you know, getting into this other question from the attendee is, um, you know, is this affordable to, to not only, you know, I guess first hard cost, get the devices, have them installed and then get certified. I mean, I mean, you know, some of these devices coming on the market that I know aren't certified, but are giving out pretty good, cool data, right? And more and more people are getting them. Even that's a tough sell to ask people to pay that much for those. So I guess, you know, what kind of costs are you seeing for certified devices and then how many is it that you need to get a space certified um, and then what are the certification fees i guess okay so uh all again really great questions and I, i'm going to try to answer as succinctly as i can but it's a com complicated question but i will give you a really good answer um hmm. devices all range in price depending first and foremost on the purpose so the fit for purpose an outdoor monitor is going to be more expensive than an indoor monitor as a general rule so for indoor, they range anywhere from $200 devices, I think is the low end that we currently have, to the high end of, I think the Kytera is about 2000, if I'm not mistaken, US. So huge variance. And the reasons for that, I, I, I can go into, but largely it's because, again, a lot of R&D on that Kytera device, it's beautiful, um, it's gorgeous for the interior space. It's really meant for um, people who wanna have a really sexy device on the wall that has a lot of bells and whistles. It also has a really awesome uh, swap cartridge so that when you need to swap a cartridge out and replace the sensor, let's say in a year's time, it's dirty and you need to replace it, you swap it out immediately. So it's almost like a printer cartridge where other devices, it takes just a little bit more maintenance and care. You can clean it, but it just takes a little bit more doing. So that's why you're paying a, a difference in the price. Um, the outdoor monitors and induct monitors, because they're more technical, because of what they need to do, and because they have a case built around them to protect them, you're paying for that. So those are gonna range in probably a couple of thousand, but you're only gonna need one of those, or maybe two of those, and that would be for monitoring of a whole building and its HVAC system, depending, again, on the complexity of your system. So if you have an AP, Part of their job is to tell you how many monitors you're going to need. So let's say for residential, you choose a low-end device. You need one in each bedroom. You've got a master bedroom, uh, you know, guest bedroom, and then you have maybe one community area. So you've got three monitors times 200 apiece. That's your hard cost for the monitors. The pulling of cables and wires, you have to pay, of course, for your data plan, whatever you intend to actually have as your wireless plan, and then you need to pay for your data provider. And that is usually up to, again, the cost for each data provider program. We don't sell those, but it's usually the same as the software program. Every month it would be a $100 fee or an annual fee of like $1,500. So you put that into it. And then the last piece is that sort of squishy cost of how much is your contractor. You know, if you have to go in and change out drywall to accommodate new fixtures and that type of thing. Um, and that is very different from region to region. If you have union fees, weekend fees, after hours fees or otherwise. Um, and then the last piece is just the uh, cost for registration for certification itself, which you can do on the reset website. And it will immediately spit out the cost for your initial certification and your annual recertification. It's based on your project size. And I'll, I'll tell you that our we don't have technically a registration fee. Mm -hmm. We have a just a certification fee, um, and it is it's it's an unremarkable amount of money. So that that's the part that's not going to be a problem. But you could put together a, a pricing list. Um, and a proposal with all of that on it with, with zero hesitation. Like you could actually have a pretty accurate mm -hmm. read as long as you have your AP help you with quantities. So these devices that are um, certified in your program, they're all listed on the Reset website? Yes, right. Um, and so if you go to the reset.build um, website, yeah. there's a section that you can actually click on and if you go under directory, mm -hmm. you've got 
projects that you can look at. You can find the reset AP. You have the data providers, that's the software, mm -hmm. and then you have monitors. Mm -hmm. And currently the monitors are separated by the type. So if you need an indoor, if you need an induct, or if you need an outdoor, now the caveat to outdoor is that those are approved on a case by case basis. So if you have a need for an outdoor monitor, we have plenty that are acceptable, but we mm -hmm. currently do not certify mm -hmm. outdoor monitors because those are highly technical pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. So the ones you are certifying, is it um, um, for the manufacturers, what kind of costs are for them? Do they have to be tested yearly? Obviously, I'm sure there's a lot to it, but I guess the basic. <laughs> yeah, um, and that is handled by my colleague in Shanghai. That's where our yeah. testing lab is. And so pricing, um, I, I'm not going to probably quote that because that's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. But um, the cost is really in shipping. You need to ship five monitors to the lab. Um, the testing is to ensure consistency between the monitors. So what we're really looking for is any deviation between monitor A and monitor uh, mm -hmm. B, let's say. So of those five monitors, the testing period usually takes at minimum a month, 30 days. It usually goes a little bit longer. And from that, we'll understand um, if, if they're trending similarly. Uh, the test, the cost for that, I, again, off the top of my head, I'll be mistaken, so I would happily follow up or connect anybody who's interested with my colleague who's in charge mm -hmm. of that. Um, so getting to the certification, something you st stuck out to me, you had said, you know, a spike here and there, not a huge deal, don't panic. Um, so I guess, just overview, what is it that gets you certification? Is it this year-long mm -hmm. aggregate? of maintaining averages of those targets? What is it, you know? Yeah, so in the standard, there is an algorithm that actually explains the complexity of this. And basically there's two things to take away. We are looking to ensure that there is completeness of data. And then we're looking at the performance data. Like, are you hitting the thresholds? So the two of those together will allow you to either pass or fail. And it's done on a monthly cycle. So we're looking at all of your monitors deployed. We're looking at all of them aggregated together and basing it on those two criteria. Is there enough data or is something missing? Because obviously we're not going to certify a building if its data is full of holes. You have to have a percentage that is credible to attest to, yes, we feel confident that this building is reporting sufficiently and enough. And then the other piece is, are you hitting the targets as designed? Is your PM 2.5 hitting the target? Now, you can have a few bad days. There is a cushion in there. Let's say somebody unplugs the monitor unknowingly and you, you miss a piece of data for a period of time. There's a percent allowance for that type of missing data. There's also a percent allowance for some really bad days. Let's say you just have an epic air quality day and your HVAC system is just dying, trying to keep up, um, and it took a minute for your team to, to get it back into a, a, a safe zone again. Now, as provided you don't exceed those percentage allowances, you will be in certification mode. And every month, your Reset Cloud will send you analytics on how close you're coming to either failing or if you're on target to pass. The requirement for reset for initial, what we call initial certification, is you have to show a three month consistent passing of both of those two criteria. Enough data and hitting your targets. So three months, if you can prove that, that usually trends to show us that your building is on point. If you cannot do that for a three month period, say you've got two that are poor, they fail, um, that you have one you pass and then you fail another, you're just not quite showing us that you've got a program in place that's consistent and you need to fine tune something. Um, so at any point, if you sort of quote unquote, fall out of graces with those targets, if you can't maintain the three months, you would fail certification and you would have to do whatever you need to do to get your building back on target again. Your reset certification would then start over again. So this is why I said, if I could come up with a better way to describe certification, for an ongoing life of a building, I would. It's dynamic certification. It's gonna ebb and flow with your building. But initial certification is three months of passing those performance targets. It seems like a um, sort of a case study. I, I, do you do those, maybe video, like 
here's where they're at, here's some issues they had, and you know, here's how they fixed it. You know, is that anything yeah. you've been working on? We have, um, we, the thing with air quality you have to understand is that we often don't hear a lot of the case studies until after the fact because it is such a cagey topic. People are often very hesitant to talk about the air quality failures and problems that they're having. Um, it's only after they have remediated and after they have come out on the other side with a success story do we hear about it. So do we have those? Absolutely. We have actually some remarkable ones that occurred over just this last year with um, a building owner who has six buildings. Only one of them was pursuing reset certification. Mm -hmm. They had a quality issue because maintenance teams were coming and painting sprinkler heads and the VOC levels were through the roof and they couldn't figure out why. And the tenants in the building actually went on strike for a month and would come back. Hmm. And it took them a really hmm. game to actually gain confidence back into those tenants and back into this. And because they didn't have monitoring areas to show them where the source was coming from. That building owner, because of all the anxiety and the problems that that mm. caused in trying to get their tenants back in, with the six buildings that they have, they now have pursued reset for all of them. They also now just attained reset certification for that building that was initially a problem. Mm. And they've held their certification. And they did it purposefully to try to build confidence into the tenants to ensure them that, yes, we, we know that was a problem. It's not going to happen again. So case studies for us, the requirement for certification is we need to know the metadata for your project. We need to know who is your AP, how many square meters, some of the nuts and bolts. But the stories and things like that that we hear in case studies um, mm -hmm. are forever building as we learn more and more from the projects that have deployed. And mm -hmm. I'd have to say, you know, mm -hmm. at, at any time for projects, um, you know, they can put that information on the website and people who want to look at that data, um, if it's been made public, you can go into the reset website and look at projects all over the world to see mm -hmm. um, how they're performing, whether or not they're certified, and then reach out to those individuals mm -hmm. um, if you want to learn more, especially for typologies that are unique. We have mm -hmm. a sports complex that just certified. We have a cathedral in Pittsburgh that's been certified for almost two years. So there's some really, um, we also have the world's first restaurant that's built for a shell and interior. And what they have done is use that as a means to get people yeah. in during COVID when they're able to, mm -hmm. because they have a monitor that attests to the air quality and how that actually parallels with human health and safety. So there's some really remarkable case studies. I would love to have more, but as you can understand, um, that takes it takes a partnership with the project teams to really decide if that's something that they're ready to promote outwardly. Absolutely, I mean nobody nobody necessarily wants to promote their you know their failures, uh, but uh, yeah. I think that I think the one you shared I really appreciate. I think that especially that first one and then some of these other anecdotal ones um, being able to reopen because of COVID, uh, I think very important. So thanks for for sharing that. Um, a little bit more on some of the metrics. So, you know, I've come to understand that dew point actually is more important um, of a metric than humidity, especially for mold uh, applications. So I guess my question is, first of all, I was surprised to see humidity was just something you had to monitor and didn't have to maintain. Um, but what are your thoughts? Where does, are you guys looking at dew point? Have you ruled that out? Uh, Cause I know that's just an equation of temperature and humidity at the end of the day. Um, you know, what are your, what are, what's sort of the overall thought there if there has been any from reset? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, especially our, our my, the co-author of, of the standard, he and I have been in conversations about this and it's largely be, been because of COVID, I think, and everybody being very concerned about, um, you know, higher humidity being better for human health and hitting that, you know, sweet spot being better for us, but bad for the building. And I, I think that that's sort of brought up this topic. Will we have requirements for it, whether it's absolute humidity or relative humidity and all of that? I don't think so. And the reason is because 
that is usually either a code requirement or something that is already mandated through an ASHRAE, an ISHRAE, a RIVA standard. If RESET actually had a standard, it would conflict with that code. So I don't think that that's something that we feel comfortable in doing because that creates um, a, a conflict of, of how a building is performing regionally. So how would we how would we write a static number? We would not be able to. Um, and writing recommendations and practices that would be applicable for the entire world is just way too much for us to take on. However, to your point, is there a difference between relative humidity and absolute humidity or dew points? Of course there is. And I, I think what's important is that if we've learned anything at all during this pandemic is to understand, A, what's good for a person is not good for a building. And do you understand the difference of what it means to have a humidity during winter and humidity during summer? The two very different things. And, you know, I, I don't think most people uh, understand the science behind, you know, the capacity for air to hold water. But that's really just the basics of it. It's like in, in humid conditions um, in the winter, that's just not a lot of water. And you still need to augment your interior spaces. However, you know, humidity indoors is different than outdoors, period. So we, I think that there's just a lot to unpack there. And I think it's basically that, that in and of itself is a, is a, is a CEU. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's definitely, definitely a whole focus session uh, that pe people need to be doing. So maybe the answer then to this next question was the answer to this last one, but radon, right? Huge issue. Um, we know that in the U S even the EPA tries to list these counties in zone ones, twos, and threes, and even people in you know the the low zones are uh, having radon issues. I'm personally having a radon issue, and I'm in a low zone, lowest one. So how or why has um, you know radon not major standard? Is it a consideration? You know, it's it, we have in the standard this asterisk that says other, and that other represents all of these other potential pollutants that would come on board. And I think radon, radon is one of those things. You, you, there are continuous radon monitors, but it's it's kind of like CO monitors. They're they're a little bit different because what they need to do is well, they, a couple things. First is a radon uh, kit that you can order is cheap. And you can take a sample, get numbers relatively quickly when you're trying to do an assessment. Ongoing and continuous monitoring for radon is a little bit like an oxymoron in some ways, like continuous monitoring of C. You don't want to have continuous monitoring of that. You want an alarm that tells you when it's high out, or you need to have an alarm that triggers some kind of exhaust, or you've got, you know, if you're a passive house or some other, you've got already some kind of exhaust pipe as a safeguard for radon. But you know, I think the important distinction is, is that if there is technology that we think is a um, reliable enough in this monitoring setting, again, it needs to be a sensor that is fit for a continuous monitor. It's very different than a one time. The second is it needs to be affordable. And that's sort of the, the killer of a lot of these sort of uh, technical improvements that we're looking at in pollutants such as ozone and formaldehyde. Now, formaldehyde is just not reliable enough. We, we just have not seen anybody get their arms around a sensor for formaldehyde. Would we love to? Of course we would. It's incredibly important pollutant. We'd love to speciate to that level. Um, ozone is, is another hot button issue because um, there is technology out there, but it's extraordinarily expensive. So we, we don't feel that it's fit for us to say that now you have a requirement for a pollutant and that sensor in and of itself is, you know, between three and five thousand dollars. Well, that kicks your monitor up to already now a potentially five thousand dollar piece. And now you need five of them, you know, on a, on a low budget project. And, and so I think that, again, there has to be a lot of parts and pieces put together so that we can actually force the market. But. For some of those, um, it's just not ready yet. And radon is interesting, but I think right now, because there is sufficient monitoring that you can do independently, and it does not require a continuous monitor device, um, we would like to see that, and, and we would potentially fold that into the standard the same way we have with um, carbon monoxide. We mm -hmm. do have that as part of the standard, but it's not required. Mm -hmm. It depends on your project typology. Sure. 
Um, you had mentioned briefly Passive House. Uh, what ways does your program connect with that? I love Passive House and Reset, and we have a couple of projects that didn't um, actually certify in the under Passive House, but they did pursue Reset and with the um, trajectory of following Passive House. So mm -hmm. we have a so we have an amazing relationship mm -hmm. with the Passive House North America, and um, we've done a lot of sort of deeper dives into what would be applicable. I think we're doing our first multifamily low income housing project, if I'm not mistaken, for Passive House and Reset. So that'll be interesting to watch. That uh, hits a lot of these topics that we've been talking about today. A lot of firsts with that. Um, the reason why I love Passive House, uh, especially when it comes to Core and Shell is because the uniqueness of the passive house design with its um, ventilation hygiene mm. that all sets you up mm. if you're using an erv that just by design sets you up already to satisfy the core and shell requirements in in mm. cases you would already have every piece you place along with a very acute understanding of your hvac system to know what your air is before and after that to me is one of the easiest applications for dual certification. The nice thing about it is that where Passive House starts, its strength is in hygiene ventilation by design. That is what they do, along with the energy efficiencies and, and all those that they're known for. But that hygiene ventilation is written into the Passive House standard. That's the science of, coupled with the science of data quality. So what that point is, if you have monitoring inside, you now can prove the case that Passive House satisfies their criteria and delivers good air quality. And for a lot of people, I think they've thought that by having an airtight envelope, it means you're going to have crappy indoor air quality. And that's just really not been the case mm -hmm. because of that ventilation hygiene piece that they require. People forget mm -hmm. that part. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, and Jeanette, we're a little bit over our time, but I appreciate you sticking around with us for a lot of great questions and uh, a lot of great conversation. This is a huge, very important topic. Um, so really excited for the work that you're doing and thanks to Reset and you for, for joining us. And before we head out, I just, again, where can people go to either contact you or learn more or see more about the AP trainings if they wanna move forward? Yeah, well, obviously, our newsletter is the best way to do that so that you don't have to constantly go to the website and look at our posts, but the Reset uh, newsletter will come to you, and that will have a host of information on it, whether it be our congratulatory, celebratory newsletters um, for the projects that are being certified, um, announcements of new APs and regions, or for trainings. So sign up for the newsletter, and you can do that, of course, by going to the website and clicking to opt into that. The second is obviously reach out to me or the team at any point. So I think that I had on my screen earlier and in my information, um, it's a green build. Send me any questions that you have and I can forward them to the correct team member depending on what your concern is. Um, and the website, of course, navigating around, um, we've got a tab called resources and that will hook you up with all kinds of webinars. We've got the training if you wanted to kind of get a kickstart on that. There's eight learning models you can listen to as well as uh, the index training and we'll have a training for the reset materials coming up for our APs. So stay tuned for those announcements, but yeah, feel free to reach out to me at any point. Well, great. Thank you so much for joining us, Anjanette. Um, take care, everyone. Stay safe out there. Have a great rest of your week. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you so much. Yep. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.